Uh, sir, with your permission, I am starting the today's. Yeah, we can start it. Uh, very good evening, doctors. I am Dr. Stalin on behalf of Shield Healthcare, welcoming you all for today's webinar. Uh, the topic for the day is male infertility behind semen analysis. I kindly request the participants to post their queries in the comment box so that at the end of the presentation, we'll be having a queue, short uh, QA session. And now it's time to introduce our uh, speaker for this evening, Dr. Uh, Jay Krishnan, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for accepting our invitation, and it's an honor to introduce you, sir. So, doctor is the managing director and chief consultant of uh, reproductive medicine, KJK Hospital, Trivandrum, Kerala. And sir has uh, 12 years of experience in medical college and 22 years of experience in private setup. Sir has more than 34 years of experience in treating subfertile subjects. Uh, sir has performed around uh, 12,800 endoscopic procedures during the last 19 years. Sir was also the principal investigator for three research projects under STEC. And Sir has a vast experience and expert in IVF and ICSI techniques. Uh, sir has uh, 32 national and 8 international journals to his credit. And also authored two books on fertility management and contributed chapters in 17 books. Sir has received the RKK Thampan Award in 1983 and Foxy Korean Award in 1986. So with this introduction, I welcome you, sir. Request you to take over the session, sir. Yeah, so thank you very much for the kind invitation. Uh, the topic of the day is uh, on uh, male infertility uh, beyond semen analysis. And uh, am I audible and the screen is visible, Mr. Stalin? Yes, sir. You are audible, but uh, you need to share your screen, sir. Share your screen. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now it is visible, sir. Yeah. So I think in the next 40, 45 minutes, I'll be taking you through male infertility. What is the current scenario and uh, what one should do beyond uh, semen analysis in treating the male? Uh, it is said that infertility affects nearly 10 to 15 percentage of the men in the reproductive age group. And uh, male factor infertility is not fully understood. And half of the cases, it is uh, more or less unexplained or idiopathic. We know the first test one can start off will be a semen analysis. And in doing semen analysis by the conventional way using the newborn counting chamber, 15 percentage of the cases do not reveal obvious abnormalities. This should be kept in mind. Just doing semen analysis alone will not detect obvious abnormalities in 15 percentage. And the spermatozoa of the infertile men have a lower DNA integrity than fertile men. This is uh, more, very important because the genetic information is passed on to the next generation. So it's a couple-oriented approach which we adopt for uh, evaluating an infertile couple. So the male as well as the female come to us and uh, they should be uh, evaluated uh, in the same sitting itself. So the agenda for today, I'll be taking you through the recent changes in the WHO laboratory methods and the reference values for the examination of the human semen. Uh, I will take you through the evidence of the detrimental effect of the sperm DNA fragmentation on reproductive outcomes. And uh, the third topic which I would cover will be the findings of varicocele related infertility and the outcomes of microsurgical varicocele repair. And lastly, I'll be taking you through azoospermia, concentrating more on the current management of non-obstructive azoospermia, seeking fertility, and the new opportunities that are emerging to achieve a biological fatherhood. We all know that the semen analysis is the most widely used biomarker to assess male infertility. Whenever a couple comes to you, the must the first and easiest method by which to rule out a male factor will be to look at the semen analysis. We usually do the semen analysis with two to three days abstinence. 
and a wide bottle wide mouth bottle is given a private room is also given for this uh, couple to collect the sample and the semen analysis is examined within 30 minutes and uh, otherwise we have to investigate the male the focus always has been on the physical examination if you do not do physical examination you miss hypospadiasis epispadiasis you miss varicocele you miss the size and consistency of the testes and all the other abnormalities and of course the most easiest way by looking whether the male is normal or not is looking at the semen parameters and we do the semen analysis as a routine it should be kept in mind that the sperm dysfunctions can occur in various conditions and the most important condition and the most controversial one is varicocele varicocele is considered as a leading cause for male infertility because varicocele can impair the spermatogenesis through several distinct pathophysiological mechanisms so the importance of evaluating the male in a standing position and asking them to perform the vasselva maneuver is much more important to diagnose the varicocele and the current evidence supports that oxidative stress in varicocele is a key element in pathophysiology of varicocele treated infertility so whenever you find the motility or the count is reduced it is oxidative stress which has occurred as a key element in this condition and that also should be kept in mind with a laboratory perspective you can measure the oxidative stress especially when a man comes with varicocele it is by looking at the sperm dna fragmentation there are various methods of checking the sperm dna fragmentation and the most common one is the SCD, the sperm chromatin dispersion, or the SCSA, that is also a chromatographic method of diagnosing the sperm DNA fragmentation. These are the two trusted and followed sperm DNA tests which are done. Clinically, we usually go for the repair of the varicocele, especially when the patient has got a varicocele and uh, it is painful or it is a grade 3 varicocele and you find that the parameters especially the count and the motility is affected one usually goes for a repair of the varicocele because it has been found that once you repair the varicocele it improves the natural fertility and it also helps in assisted reproductive technology after you do varicocele correction you find the sperm parameter improves and your success rate also starts improving. We come to the other condition known as a non-obstructive asuspermia, which is present in 5 to 10 percentage of the male factor, and it denotes the lack of sperm in the ejaculate, and it is due to the spermatogenic failure. So usually the non-obstructive asuspermia was unrecognized, and there is another group of condition known as obstructive asuspermia, which occurs to the obstruction in the vas epididymis or in the tract and that has got a most favorable outcome whereas a non-obstructive asuspermia normally when you do a testicular aspiration you find that you diagnose it is as a non-obstructive asuspermia so advances in molecular biology testing hormonal therapy microsurgical sperm retrieval as well as the state of art in IVF and ICSI procedures have offered revived hope so men have got chance to conceive with their own sperm in non-obstructive asuspermia also and achieve the biological fatherhood. This I will come to that later. I know I move on to the first part of my talk. What is the WHO laboratory methods for examination of the human semen? And it is way back in 2010, WHO introduced very important changes in the methods for conducting and reporting results of the routine semen analysis, looking at the volume by weight rather than a graduated pipette. Volume was also measured by weight. Motility was by two categories, namely progressive and non-progressive, in contrast to the previous uh, um, uh, the recommendation of four categories by the WHO. Morphology is by the strict criteria, the Tigerberg criteria, 
as opposed to the WHO criteria in the previous manual. So these are the changes, the volume by weight, motility by two categories, and morphology by strict criteria, that is the Tigerberg criteria. So looking at uh, the reference values, this is a major change which has occurred in 2010, almost 10 years it has, since it has been changed. Volume, when you look, is considered anything more than 1.5 is normal. Count per ml per million is 15 million or more, you consider as normal. The total count being 39 million. You should have motility, more than 40% in, in the ejaculate, you say it is uh, normal. And the progressive motility, that is grade A and grade B are taken into one. It should be 32 percentage. And when you look at the morphology, you find that it should be more than 4%. So that is, has been the major change from 50%, it has come down to 4%. And the leukocyte count should be around 1, uh, 1 million. So this is the 2010 chain, changes which occurred in the WHO reference value, which has been uh, often looked upon with a lot of criticism. Uh, what are the criticism? I'll take you uh, to that. The WHO lab manual for examination and the processing of the semen <clears throat> was based on 2007 samples from recent fathers, that is those who are impregnated the wife, their sample was checked as uh, uh, for this criteria. And the percentile which was taken was a fifth percentile. You see the fifth percentile is 1.5 ml, where you go to the 50th percentile, it is 3.7. The count also was taken on the fifth percentile, whereas 50th should be around about 73 million. And total count also 39 million, 255. And when you look at the mortality also, you find that the fifth percentile was taken into consideration compared to the 50th and 95. So what is wrong in taking the fifth percentile? Because first of all, this seven criteria was based on a population-based study of recent fathers with time to pregnancy less than one year or less. It was not based on infertile people or infertile couple. Those who are fathered children, their, their seven sample was taken. And data for nearly 1,900 women were obtained to generate the percentile distributions out of which the fifth per percentile was taken and the semen volume, sperm count, motility, vitality, and morphology was accounted like that. The fifth percentage was established as a lower cutoff limit for normality, making the reference values much lower. If you take the 50th percent, it will be much higher. But the fifth percentage established as a lower cut limit, cutoff limits for the normality. And it has been suggested that the experts suggests that caution should be exercised to interpret a semen analysis based on the new changes. Issues related to new forma format of data generation and semen analysis methods may explain the lower cutoff limits. Some of the uh, remarks were that you have to make up to 50th percentile, but the WHO stood with the fifth percentile. But whenever you find a result for a patient, you have to exercise caution because these new changes will uh, have a lot of uh, effect on them, on the person as such. So clinicians should not expect an analysis of a widely ranging parameters on the whole ejaculate to give a robust discriminatory information for the male fertility potential. So it is not given, giving a wide ranging parameter for the whole ejaculate. It is looking at the fifth percentile will give you lot of discriminatory information of the male fertility potential. So this should be kept in mind whenever you look at the semen analysis with the 2010 WHO um, manual uh, which has been published. Male infertility evaluation should go beyond a simple semen analysis. That's a topic which I have chosen because we know that history taking, physical examination, Endocrine, pro endocrine profile and the laboratory sperm function test are minimum standards for evaluating a male. But the conventional semen analysis is not enough because a lot of things happen, especially, especially when you look at the chromosome, 
you find there is a single strand break, break there is a mis mismatch, a double stranded break, or an intra strand cross link break, or an inter strand cross link. All these things happen in the chromosome, which is the most important thing, which is not reflected onto the semen analysis. So, should you should have an idea regarding these changes? So, a semen analysis per se is not enough to evaluate a male couple, male person. As told earlier, the sperm DNA fragmentation reflects on the oxidative stress which affects the sperm during the transit through the epididymis after ejaculation is a major cause of the sperm DNA fragmentation outside the testis. There are several causes why uh, sperm DNA fragmentation occurs and has been implicated for the impairment of the sperm DNA integrity. Cigarette smoking is taken as one of the parameters for increasing the sperm DNA fragmentation. Radiation, chemotherapy and chemotherapy are also associated with sperm DNA fragmentation. The presence of pus cells, leukocytospermia, is also related to increase in sperm DNA fragmentation. Varicocele, cancer, obesity, especially the suprapubic obesity, also advanced paternal age. When you are more than 45 years, you find that the sperm DNA fragmentation starts increasing. These are the factors you have to keep in mind. Why do you bother much about the high sperm DNA fragmentation? Uh, we bother much about the SDF because reduced fertility rates have been reported in cases of high SDF. It impairs the embryo development and compromises the integrity of the embryonic genome. Increased risk of miscarriage also has been associated with high sperm DNA damage. That is why in recurrent pregnancy loss, recurrent implantation failure, you have to look into the sperm DNA fragmentation. Any of these tests, the commonly one which we do is the SCSA test, or you can look for the SDA also, which evaluates the sperm DNA fragmentation. The clinical utility of sperm DNA fragmentation it is important to abstain from ejaculation for a fixed period of one to two days before the sperm collection due to the influence of long abstinence period. If you have a long abstinence period, you find that the SDF also starts rising. So normally for our ICSI and IVF, especially for ICSI, we ask the patient to abstain only for one to two days. Suppose this, uh, the, uh, the couple is not being told to abstain only for one to two or ejaculate a couple of days before the ovum pickup, you find that longer abstinence periods has got an effect on the sperm DNA, frag more of sperm DNA fragmentation, and you find that it affects the fertilization, the embryonic genome, and the pregnancy rates. Despite recognizing that sperm DNA fragmentation is an integral part of the semen analysis, it is a debatable question. ASRM recently conceded that determining values of sperm DNA fragmentations may be clinically informative for intrauterine inseminations, IVF, and ICSI. And the important take home message from this slide will be you should have a shorter period of abstinence whenever you go in for IUI, IVF, or ICSI. A larger abstinence, you find that the sperm DNA fragmentation is more, and that may affect your embryo quality, the embryonic genome, and the pregnancy rate. The other question which remains is whether it is a testicular sperm or the ejaculated sperm, which is better. Various studies have shown that the sperm DNA fragmentation was five-fold lower in testicular sperm compared with the ejaculated sperm. So the testicular sperm, you find that the sperm DNA fragment is much lower because they are not exposed on the way of the genital tract till they ejaculate. So the use of testicular sperm, especially when a man has got a high level of SD sperm DNA fragmentation is helpful because you find that the outcomes are much better when you use the testicular sperm rather than the ejaculate sperm. So what are the factors associated with sperm DNA fragmentation? There are various factors involved. I will look at this figure where you find that 
the male accessory gland infections are one the seminal vesicle prostate and this is one of the most important condition environmental factors exposure lifestyle factors exposure to high temperature palate exposure exposure to various drugs also influences smoking definitely a man has, a man has got a high dna fragmentation the first thing you can advise them is to stop smoking and pollution and radiation also has been associated with the sperm dna fragmentation a prolonged stasis of the spermatozoa in epididymis or in transit can increase the sperm dna fragmentation and uh, immature and abnormal spermatozoa also can have sp a high sperm dna fragmentation systemic diseases like diabetes cancer and systemic infections also increases the stress on the sperm dna and you find that the sperm dna fragmentation so these are the factors which you have to keep in mind especially when a man has got a sperm dna fragmentation more than 30 percentage when you detect them by using either of these tests now coming to the next slide you find that elevated sperm dna fragmentation is associated with unexplained infertility when a man comes the normal count you will have but when a man doesn't conceive over a stipulated time you call it as an unexplained infertility so this study which looked into the sperm dna fragmentation showed that the elevated sdf is the reason for the unexplained infertility and you should take measures to reduce the sperm dna fragmentation when you do intrauterine insemination IUI outcome is negatively affected by elevated sperm DNA fragmentation. You find that live birth rate with IUI, when the sperm DNA fragmentation is more than less than thirty, you find it is nineteen. Whereas you find sperm DNA fragmentation more than thirty in this study, it was hardly one point five percent. So your success of IUI as well as IVF comes down, especially with an elevated sperm DNA fragmentation. pregnancies in case of elevated sperm dna fragmentation whenever you find that the sperm dna fragmentation was high the pregnancies were on a lower range whereas in icsi procedures also you find that it is much better with 42 percentage when the elevation of the sperm dna was not so high this is based on meta analysis of 16 studies with nearly 3000 couples where they found that increased miscarriage in ivf xc is associated with a high sperm dna fragmentation and thus much thus this must be kept in mind especially when a patient comes to you with a recurrent pregnancy loss this is looking into the this journal uh, patients with varicose seal have a higher proportion of sperm with massive dna damage so the massive dna damage may be a nuclear damage may be a a chromatin damage as recognized by the sperm chromatin dispersion test this is the other test which is used to diagnose sperm dna fragmentation only two tests are validated one is the scd that is the sperm chromatin dispersion test the other is the sperm chromatin assay scsa which is a chromatographic test which is having a high uh, high value among the other tests like halo test and the tunnel test so sperm dna fragmentation is one thing which you have to do especially when the sperm analysis is normal the major problem is impaired sperm chromatin is found not only in uh, men with abnormal semen but also you find that the semen may be normal a uh, semen may be normal but the chromatin may be abnormal so the best way is to look at the sperm dna fragmentation of either of these tests the sperm dna fragmentation may originate from the testis or an excellent duct system it could be on the way of the duct system also where where it happens whether if you can give oral antioxidants whether you can decrease the sperm dna fragmentation and improve the art outcomes this study by shovel in cochrane database 2011 shows that the oral antioxidants decreases the sdf and improve the art outcomes so the live birth rate also increased if you when you give oral antioxidants in patients with the 
a high level of sperm DNA fragmentation. The oral antioxidants which are preferred, whenever you choose an oral antioxidant, ideally they say that you should have an oral antioxidant with vitamin C 500 milligram, vitamin E 400, folic acid 2, zinc 25 and selenium 26. And the minimum duration which you have to give is two months. The old concept was 90 days, but the newer concept is that you have to give for 60 days. So anything which happens will happen in the next 60 days and you don't have to wait up to 90 days to find whether these oral antioxidants are doing good to the patient, but the combination, any medicine, any tablets which contains these combinations will be ideal for this cup man with, uh, with a high level of sperm DNA fragmentation. A man has got varicocele and you find that the sperm DNA fragmentation is high Meta-analysis of seven studies, including 336 patients, indicated that sperm DNA fragmentation is significantly decreased after varicocele repair. So Wang et al. has demonstrated in this paper 2012 that varicocele helps to reduce the sperm DNA fragmentation after surgery, and even spontaneous conceptions do occur after varicocele surgery. So whenever you find Varicocele, look at the sperm DNA fragmentation apart from the motility and the count. And the DNA fragmentation is high. Definitely, it calls for a microsurgical repair of the varicocele. And you find that the results are much better. This study by Sandro Estevez and his group on clinical outcome, outcomes of ICSI in infertile men treated and untreated with clinical varicocele. The microsurgical method is, uh, is uh, usually done for uh, varicocele. And there was another group which was untreated also with uh, when varicocele was left behind. And look at these figures. In treated uh, varicocele patients, the fertilized egg fertilization was much better than the untreated eggs. And the live birth rate was 46 percentage in the treated, 31 percentage in the untreated. Miscarriage rate, when you look, it was the miscarriage rate was higher in the untreated varicocele. And this was published in the Journal of Urology 2010. So showing the beneficial effect of varicocelectomy, the microsurgical varicocelectomy prior to ICSI procedure to improve the seminal parameters. And the sperm DNA fragmentation definitely is lower in the testicular versus the ejaculated sperm as compared by this study. And uh, here you find this study by Sandro Estevez and Martin. Uh, you find that the ejaculate sperm, uh, you find, uh, uh, and the testicular sperm. And the SDF was marked lower in the testicular sperm. And in the ejaculated sperm, it was much higher. So that throws more light whether you use a testicular sperm or an ejaculated sperm. Now I move on to non-obstructive asuspermia. Affects almost one percentage of all women, all men, and 10 to 15 percentage of infertile males. One thing you have to keep in mind is that 50 percentage of men with non-obstructive asuspermia have foci of sperm production within their dysfunctional testes. So they're not, the foci may not be, uh, it may be scattered. So this has to be extra extracted 50%, that is half the patients will have foci or sperm production, which can be extracted and used for XC. So that is regarding how to diagnose a non-obstructive asuspermia. You diagnose non-obstructive asuspermia where the patient reports with asuspermia when you palpate, you find there's a normal epididymis and palpable vas. That is to rule out the absence of vas and epididymis, which is normal or is distended. The testes may be smaller in size, less than 15 ml. And 85% uh, of testicular parenchyma is usually involved in spermatogenesis. Since about 85% of parenchyma is involved in spermatogenesis. So testicular volume is often normal when men with non-obstructive asusperm may not be sometimes as small as an atrophic testis, 
but you find that the testicular volume is normal and 85% of the parenchyma is involved in the spermatogenesis. When you look at the FSH levels, the FSH levels are usually elevated. And looking at the testosterone levels, it is less than 300 nanograms found in about 50% of the affected men. The abnormal testosterone levels reflect the Leydig cell insufficiency, which is usually accompanied, accompanied by elevated LH levels. So FSH is elevated, low testosterone levels, and when you look at the LH also, it may be ele elevated also. And testis may be sometimes smaller than normal size or even normal in size. And uh, you diagnose a testicular, um, what you call a non-obstructive acyspermia. Diagnosis is by a testicular aspiration. Gone are the days which we do the testicular biopsy. You can use the a testicular aspiration method where you just suck out the seminiferous tubule uh, by giving a local anesthesia and there's no stitches and the patient goes home the same day and you subject them a few bit of, of uh, seminiferous tubule is needed for diagnosing and the pathologist tells you whether you're dealing with hypospermatogenesis, whether it is a germ cell arrest or a germ cell aplasia as in certainly cell only, or it is tubular sclerosis or a combination of uh, these common phenotypes. So histopathology is, a, is the crux in the diagnosis of non-obstructive azospermia. And TISA or testicular aspiration is a method of choice which you do with a, with a uh, butterfly needle and a syringe attached to the end and negative suction and you suck out the seminiferous tubules. Look whether there are sperms. If there is no sperms, you can just mince the tubules and then see whether it is uh, entrapped inside. And evaluating 356 men with non-obstructive azospermia, it has been found that patients with certainly cell-only syndrome had lower sperm retrieval rates. The retrieval rates or sperm was 19.5 percentage in SEO, that is certainly cell only syndrome. And those with maturation arrest also, you can retrieve the sperms in 40.3 percentage of the cases, according to this large study published by Sandro Estevez group. Now, after non obstructive azospermia, uh, we have to deal with uh, a, uh, the management of azospermia and the role of gonadotrophin therapy. Do you give uh, gonadotrophin in azospermia? And how to go ahead when you, do, when you manage a case of azospermia? Azospermia is a lack of sperm in the ejaculate. So whenever the, report by, the lab tells, gives you a report as azospermia, you should ask the lab people whether they have centrifuged it. And uh, sometimes you find in the deposit, they get a couple of sperms. So that is not azospermia, that is cryptozoospermia. So it is important that the lab does the centrifugation and you have an in-house lab so that you can diagnose azospermia and cryptozoospermia, which affects one to three percentage of the male population and 10 to 15 percentage of the infertile males. So complete absence of sperms, you call it azospermia. What is the prognosis and management of uh, differentially affected types of azospermia? Basically, you have an obstructive azospermia and non-obstructive azospermia. Non-obstructive azospermia, I told you regarding the features. First, I will deal with obstructive azospermia. The clinical picture, you find they have normal testes, endocrine profile, and the profile is normal, and mechanical blockage has occurred. So when you do a testicular aspiration, you find there is normal spermatogen as well. The things are very fine. They have got a good chance to have a baby. Whereas non-obstructive azospermia, when you do a TISA, you find that you don't get the sperms, you have only the seminiferous tubules, which you subject them for histopathological examination. And they diagnose the various types of non-obstructive sperm, azospermia, which I told you. The non-obstructive could be spermatogenic failure, or it could be hypo-hypo. How will you diagnose hypo-hypo? You diagnose hypo-hypo by looking at the FSHLH, which is less than 1.2 milli international units, low testosterone, small testis, and poor virilization. 
whereas spermatogenic failure as i told earlier and lh fsh lh raised or normal testosterone low or normal testis small or normal so you have got two options with spermatogenic failure and you find that the spermatogenesis is disrupted in non obstetric asuspermia whereas in obstetric asuspermia the spermatogenesis is normal you can use these sperms for testicular aspiration and icsi procedure and they usually have a favorable outcome just like a normal patient with a tubal factor or any other factors they are taking for icsi so a non obstetric asuspermia due to spermatogenic failure is a irreversible condition it could be congenital causes like testicular dysgenesis or cryptorchidism or genetic abnormalities like klinefelter syndrome or the y micro deletions it could be acquired also which occurs when testicular torsion occurs sometimes we find in young children testicular torsion or trauma occurs or it can occur in post inflammatory conditions like mumps or arthritis or exogenous factors like cytotoxic drugs irradiation testicular cancer or systemic diseases like cirrhosis of the liver renal failure sometimes you don't have a cause then you call it idiopathic or unknown etiology the prognostic factors for sperm retrieval success 10% of men with non obstetric hesospermia harbor micro deletions within the y long chromosome or the y chromosome and which clusters the genes involved in the spermatogenesis regulation so you have the y chromosome del micro deletion testing to be done in asuspermia as well as for uh, oligospermia severe oligospermia and you find that once you diagnose y chromosome micro deletion you apply the molecular technology which allows the recognition of three regions in the y chromosome which is designated as a z of a a z of b and a z of c each one including a major candidate gene so there are three sub regions in the y chromosome designated as a b and c so what is the importance of a b and c deletions differentially affects these regions causing a disruption of the germ cell development suppose it is a z of a deletion it affects the entire a z of region associated with complete absence of spermatogenesis suppose the y the y chromosome micro deletion report comes as a z of b and b c deletions are similar thus meaning that the sperm retrieval success is virtually nil so before going for sperm retrieval you have to do the y chromosome a micro deletion unfortunately we also try to look at the my y chromosome micro deletion but none of the labs in our country are doing the y micro y chromosome uh, micro deletion and uh, even the, the designated higher labs told us that they are not doing it now so entirely you have to depend upon the other people who gets it done from outside to look at the a z of b bc because a sperm retrieval there is no purpose achieved and it is virtually nil and sperm retrieval is not recommended when there are complete deletions of a z of a or e a z of b what about a z of c yes you can get sperms in a z of c but genetic counseling should be offered to the patients why because these deletions will be invariably transmitted from the father to son so when the father has got a z of c deletion diagnosed with a y micro micro deletion test and you find that you have to counsel the couple saying that the father has got a chromosome deletion likely to be transmitted if he is going to have a son if it's a daughter it may escape so has to transmit and this has to be kept in mind that the deletion can be transmitted from the father to son so a z of c deletions are the only deletions uh where sperm retrieval can be advised because if you don't have a facility look at this thing you have to do sperm retrieval in all these non obstructive and obstructive asuspermias and to come uh, to uh, once again to coming to the same thing which i told you the y chromosome micro deletion sperm retrieval success 
A is it of A nil? A is it of B nil? A is it of C? 50 to 70 percentage, you find you are able to retrieve the sperm. But proper counseling should be given to this group of patients before you go for the ICSI procedure after the sperm retrieval. Can medications help men with uh, asuspermia? Hypogonadism is uh, defined as the testosterone level less than 300 nanograms or less than 30 nanomoles. And uh, in up to 50 percentage of the men with spermatogenic failure. Most important thing, the high intratestosterone levels are essential in regulating spermatogenesis in combination with subtly cell stimulation by FSH. We often see the general practitioners and some of the doctors giving testosterone injections in giving, in giving injections like uh, testosterone in oil, giving weekly, monthly, and gradually you're creating a, a condition known as a rebound phenomena or asuspermia. And once you stop it, a rebound phenomena occurs. And in some cases, hardly few patients, I never seen any patients uh, with a rebound phenomena after testosterone injection. But uh, when you give drugs like um, uh, what you call HCG, as well as FSH, it helps to stimulate the spermatogenesis. The FSH stimulates the subtly cells and HCG improves the intratestosterone levels in regulating the spermatogenesis and often used in combination with subtly cell stimulation is quite useful. Paradoxically, weak stimulation of the Leydig and subtly cells by endogenous gonadotropins uh, helps to restore the spermatogenesis in this group of patients. So you may have to give HCG in low doses to, uh, with 2000 units or uh, with a recombinant uh, HCG with 250 microgram twice weekly, then you know, for six weeks before adding on the FSH stimulation. And you may have to continue the therapy for three to six months and see whether the stimulation is regenerating, is increasing the testosterone level and whether the sperm starts appearing in the semen. So any of these conditions, you find that hypogonadism, within six months, you find the sperms are seen in the ejaculate. That is a very prognostic good factor, and you can continue the gonadotropin stimulation in this group of patients. So the role of interventions prior to sperm retrieval is to enhance the intratesticular testosterone for that, please do not give testosterone injections or testosterone capsules or tablets. Uh, all you can give is human chorionic gonadotropin, which helps to increase the intratestic testosterone concentration, 2000 units over twice a week for six weeks or up to 12 weeks. And once you are sensitized, uh, increase the level of intratesticular testosterone, you can give FSH injections Recombinant FSH, 75 units twice weekly, or even the urinary preparations twice weekly, and aromatase inhibitors also in a group of patients, and you find that sperm retrieval is much better in this group of patients. Now we come to the famous micro TC, where testicular extraction, TSA is testicular aspiration, whereas TC is testicular extraction in Non-microsurgical retrieval attempts, micro-TC is effective when you use a microscope or a loop for men with non-obstructive asuspermia because you find that the lower tissue extraction lessens the te testicular damage and facilitates laboratory processing and sperm search, th thereby increasing the efficacy in a study involving 356 patients with non-obstructive asuspermia Estevez and Ashok Agrawal subjected them to micro TC and the sperm retrieval success according to the histopathology was if it was hyperspermatogenesis, they could get almost in 100% of the cases, maturation arrest 40%, certainly cell syndrome in 19% they could retrieve the sperms. So this also has to be kept in mind. The role of micro TC, especially when previous non-microsurgical retrieval attempts has been used in non-obstructive asuspermia. One word regarding HCG. HCG binds to the LH receptors at the LADIC cell level 
and boosts the intratesticular testosterone production. In one study involving 20 men with non-obstructive azoospermia treated with HCG, you can give 2,000 units uh, urinary HCG or recombinant HCG 250 microgram twice weekly. The intratestosterone levels were significantly higher. Once you are sensitized and the testosterone level has risen, then you can give endogenous FSH 75 units twice daily. And uh, uh, FSH levels are suppressed in half of the individuals subjected to HCG treatment due to the negative feedback of elevated testosterone. And uh, such an effect of giving FSH is beneficial. It seems that it upregulates the expression of FSH receptors, thereby increases the sertoli cell function and the presence of spermatozoa are seen in the ejaculate. So non obstructive asusperic patient, patients are also subjected to clomiphene citrate and HCG prior to sperm retrieval. The others, especially uh, uh, Sandro Estivis and Ashok Agrawal, aims at achieving 600 to 800 nanogram post treatment serum testosterone. In this study, significant higher retrieval rates were obtained in a group of patients achieving the desired hormonal level post-medical therapy. So HCG may be beneficial in non-obstructive azoospermia as it improves the spermiogenesis and spermatogonia DNA synthesis provided residual areas or complete or incomplete spermatogenesis exists. It all depends whether there are residual areas or complete or incomplete. So that is seen only in 50 percentage of the cases of non-obstructive asuspermia. Coming to varicocele repair, found in up approximately 5 percentage of men with non-obstructive asuspermia, it is debatable whether varicocele is merely coincidental or contributory to spermatogenesis disruption. Surgical repair of clinical varicocele has been attempted to improve the sperm production. So men with asuspermia with varicocele Surgical attempt in improving the sperm production has been done by surgical repair of the clinical varicose seal. And the findings indicate that repair of the palpable varicose seals increase the sperm retrieval in non obstructive asuspermia. Approximately 44% of the treated men will have enough sperms. So they will have enough sperms in the ejaculate to avoid sperm retrieval. So if you do even an asuspermia, non-obstructive asuspermia, you find that 44% of treated women will have enough sperms. They can try naturally and avoid the sperm retrieval associated with ICSI procedures. And this bar chart tells you the intratestosterone level which increases after HCG. So the, when HCG was given, this was before level, this was after level, and the intratesticular levels increased after HCG-based therapy, according to Shinjo. They gave about 2,000 units of HCG twice weekly for 6 to 12 weeks, and the spermatogonial DNA synthesis also increased. So this is indirectly showing that HCG is beneficial to increase the intratestosterone level, and it stimulates the residual spermatogenic areas. I'm taking you through a medical algorithm from the Androford by Sandro Estivas, which tells you that looking at the testosterone and estradiol levels, you can uh, find out whether the level is uh, three, less than 300 nanograms, that is 10.4 nanomoles, and you calculate the testosterone and estradiol ratio. When the testosterone and estradiol ratio, suppose the testosterone value is only 300 nanograms, and uh, estradiol value has come as uh, 1,000, you find the ratio is less than 10. That shows that aromatase hyperactivity is there, and you have to boost the testosterone level by giving aromatase inhibitor. And the drug which they recommend is anastrozole, one milligram orally, four times a day. You may have to give for two to three months. Whenever you find that the testosterone estradiol ratio is more than 10, uh, you can go for the pure therapy by giving recombinant HCG, 250 micrograms subcutaneously weekly, 
and after giving them for six to eight weeks, add recombinant FSH uh, biweekly, and you may have to continue the therapy for three to six months. Every three months to six months, look at the testosterone level, estradiol level, and uh, uh, look at the FSH levels and LH along with this. And I think if you want to get a, a result, you get it within six months. So this is a therapy followed, a medical algorithm followed by Sandro Estevez group uh, based on the testosterone, estradiol levels and giving aromatase inhibitors or in hypo-hypo patients giving recombinant HCG along with recombinant FSH and improving the spermatogenesis and you find that the retrieval rates are much better. So medical therapy may increase sperm retrieval success in men with spermatogenic failure and it has been found by this particular author that 15% of the patients with previous failed sperm retrieval attempts were given medical therapy, either HCG alone or HCG with FSH, and they found that the sperm retrieval success improved in 15% of the patients. So this has to be kept in mind. After giving HCG, you find the testosterone level going up, and then they did a sperm retrieval by the micro TC and uh, you find that the sperm retrieval under magnification is much better and you get a better sperm retrieval rate. So the options for sperm retrieval in spermatogenic failure that is non-obstructive azoospermia is primary to go for a testicular aspiration. Success is around 15 to 50 percentage. When you do a testicular extraction or TC, you find that success is 20 to 60 percentage. When you have the microscope, you dissect and choose the healthy area and then subject them for the sperm retrieval. You find that the retrieval rate jumps up to almost the double, 40 to 67 percentage. This is only with Sandro Estevis group, not being replicated, what do you call replicated or duplicated by the other group. So you have to see the majority of the people doing get about 30 to 40 percentage, much better than TSA or with TC. So micro dissection, you have, should have the microscope which we used to use during the days of uh, tubal recanalization and the magnifications and the light helps you to identify the healthy tissue and retrieve sperms. So micro TC is almost most effective than conventional TC. Conventional T TC, people use the loop, people use without the microscope, but when you look at the sperm retrieval rates, you find that the retrieval rates are much less, much lesser. With micro TC, uh, overall you find the retrieval rates with micro TC is 45 percentage. With uh, single biopsy TC, it is 25 percentage. And um, these are the groups of uh, um, pathology, histopathology could be hypospermatogenesis, 93 percentage. With single biopsy, 64 percent maturation arrest. Certainly, cell the histological categories in non obstructive uh, uh, categories, pairways it is compared, and uh, micro TC is more effective than conventional TC. And the amount of tissue removed also, can you look at the weighing scale? You look at conventional TC, it is almost 69 or 65 milligrams, whereas in micro TC, it is only eight milligrams. So, you see that. You want to remove the testicular tissue much when you do a micro TC and you can preserve the testicular function uh, for future for this group of men. So apart from that, laboratory handling of epididymal and testicular sperms, what can be done to improve the injections outcome is to optimize the sperm retrieval using the microscope, mechanical mincing, enzymatic tissue digestion and avoid hydrogenic damage. A lot of work was, has been done in Andrefurt, Sandro Estevez and Alex Vergi's uh, group when he was working in the Andrefurt. Now he is in Kraft. Definitely, you should have a clean room IVF lab, which uh, positively impacts on the outcome of uh, severe male factor infertility. When you have the conventional IVF lab, you find that uh, uh, the success rates are much lesser. And uh, you find that the clean room, you find that the, the success rate is much higher than the conventional lab. And uh, here you find the miscarriage rate 
also is uh, higher with the conventional lab, lesser with the clean room. And uh, here you look at the good embryos and average top quality embryos is higher in the clean room lab, whereas the conventional lab, the top quality is much lesser. So a clean room IVF lab, which a lot of lamina flow and uh, measures severe is definitely important for having a good outcome, especially when you deal with severe male factor in fertility. So to conclude, I would say that reproductive andrology has gone beyond just semen analysis alone. The conventional semen analysis, the new WHO uh, man semen analysis, which tells you the limitations of it, the empirical treatments have been given by many and the conventional surgeries also has been done by many. But we have to move on from the conventional semen analysis to the era of sperm uh, function testing, the DNA fragmentation testing, the reputed tests are either SCA, SCD or SCSA. And uh, when you retrieve the sperm, it will be ideal if you do the micro TSA and uh, subject all the men to the Y chromosome molecular diagnosis before sperm retrieval if you have the facility so that you can know which group of patients you can yield sperms, which group unnecessarily you don't have to subject them uh, to this uh, sperm retrieval. And you have, can have targeted therapy so that you can improve the uh, outcome in this group of patients. So coming at ART outcomes in non-obstructive asuspermia, ICSI using testicular sperm extracted from men with non-obstructive asuspermia, the outcomes are lower than ejaculated or obstructive asuspermia. You find the fertilization rates are lower in non-obstructive asuspermia compared when testicular sperm was compared with ejaculated sperm and embryo development and pregnancy rates also negatively affected by non-obstructive asuspermia. Live birth rate of ICSI was significantly lower in non-obstructive asuspermia, 21 percentage, whereas obstructive asuspermia, it was 37.5, and ejaculated sperm, it was 32.5. The overall sperm retrieval success in non-obstructive asuspermia is 41.4 percentage, but the results are lower than obstructive asuspermia, where you get almost 100 percent uh, sperm retrieval layer. And the live birth rate was also lower in the non obstructive asuspermia subjected ICSI when own testicular sperm rather than the group which used um, donor sperm. So one group received donor sperm, one group received uh, the aspirated sperm. The live birth rate was uh, less in this group of non obstructive asuspermia when you compare it, compare it with the donor sperm group. And glance towards future. Uh, we have got a lot of reports where ICSI has been done with immature germ cells yielding conflicting results. And despite the reported deliveries of healthy offspring, the method has low efficacy as currently used. No longer it is being used. Of course, in the literature, you find sparse literature regarding one pregnancy with spermatid, one sp pregnancy with uh, spermata with uh, a primary or secondary spermatozoa, but Routine use, we never use the immature germ cells. We use the spermatozoa. Furthermore, concerns really related to the potential transmission of genomically imprinted disorders raise the doubt regarding. So a lot of genomically imprinted disorders are there in the literature. And the safety of these procedures where you use immature germ cells, like maturation arrest or, or germ cells, uh, they have been associated with genomically imprinted disorders have been reported. To conclude, I would say that the conventional semen analysis limited as a surrogate, it's a, just a surrogate. Uh, you have to go further whenever the patient, because a normal semen analysis, you still find the sperm DNA fragmentation may be high. Sperm DNA fragmentation testing is a valuable tool for allowing better clinical decision. Suppose you are just doubting whether your varicocele requires surgery. If you do a sperm DNA fragmentation, the DNA fragmentation definitely is high. Don't have to depend upon the motility or the count. Definitely that's an indication for doing a microsurgical technique. Antioxidant therapy is quite good enough. And antioxidant therapy given for two months or more 
helps to improve the fertilization rate, reduces the number, reduces the abortion rate, and overall increases the live birth rate. Microsurgical varicose seal repair, if they don't conceive naturally, you can subject them for TISA or ICSI, then can, can improve the ART outcome by reducing the sperm DNA fragmentation. So the best treatment of azoospermia related fertility, proper diagnosis, interventions for optimize the sperm production, as well as microsurgical surgical retrieval using the microscope as a tool and having a state-of-art laboratory helps you to improve and tailor the control over in stimulation so that the pregnancy level can be high. So these are the new things of the future and which happens all over the globe. And if you want to have a good success rate, you have to follow up uh, these protocols, which helps to improve the sperm retrieval, improve the sperm production, and have the male having a child genetically of their own. And uh, this may help you, the lion, to roar again. Thank you once again for the patient hearing. And I'll be glad to take uh, your questions and uh, happy to share my thoughts and ideas. Thank you, Dr. Venezuela. Yes, sir. So thank you, sir. Thank you very much for the informative session, sir. Thank you. And it's uh, uh, always an uh, honor hearing you, sir. So with your presentation, we can be able to understand that a couple who reach a fertility specialist for your baby should be recommended for a sperm DNA fragmentation at the initial stage, apart from the routine semen analysis, so that they can save time and money. And also... The sperm with uh, DNA damage can cause various complications in uh, uh, ART and even in the babies. So male fertility still remains a, a struggle to diagnose and treat, sir. So thanks for sharing the advanced uh, uh, information and uh, uh, making us understanding and managing male fertility, sir. So hope the participants found this uh, session useful. Uh, sir, I will read out if, the, if there is any yeah, questions yeah. in the comment okay. box. Uh, let me wait for two to three minutes for the participants to post their queries. Sir. And there is one query from Dr. Lelis. Uh, doctor has mentioned that uh, in a primary infertility of two years, uh, semen analysis was done and total count was 2 million. No motile sperm was there and scrotal scan seems to be normal. So what should be the next procedure, sir? So married two years, um, no sperm, uh, two million and no motile sperms. Yes, sir. All are dead sperms. Yes, sir. Yeah, basically, you want to like to look at whether these sperms are live or dead. And the ideal test which we do is a hyposmolar swelling test. Uh, you have to put this uh, drop of hyposmolar solution and put a drop of this sperm and see whether there's coiling of the tails and if the coiling is not there, then you think that the hypospotic swelling test, these are live or dead, you have to differentiate. Or you can use the staining techniques also to find out whether they are live or dead. But normally we do the hypospotic swelling test and coiling is a normal phenomenon. It shows you that the sperms are live. And uh, then you have to distinguish what is the reason for that. If it is completely non-motile, it may be an immotile flagella syndrome associated with bronchiectasis, and you may have to uh, think on the molecular level and the prognosis is poor. If the sperms are alive, you can use these sperms to either you can retrieve the sperms directly from the testes and look at it and see whether you can go for an ICSI procedure and you find that you may be able to fertilize the oocytes and transfer the uh, embryos and, and obtain a reasonably okay success rate. And the most important thing is to find out which is a healthy sperm for which we use a PIXI procedure or the PIXI where it uh, binds to the hyaluronic acid dish and you can identify this group of sperms and use it for the selection, sperm selection also, apart from the sperm retrieval techniques and you find you get a reasonable success in this group of patients. Basically, a clinical examination, ruling out varicose seal, looking at the hormonal profile, FSH, LH, testosterone, 
and helps you to find out whether they have a local factor like varicocele also associated because even azoospermia is associated with varicocele a history clinical examination followed by local examination and lab investigation helps you to deal with this patient okay sir oh uh, the doctor has got her hand sir and uh, so let's wait for another 2 minutes sir, for if any questions is coming in the wait post box comment box sir whether these uh, hormones that you are, when you are mentioning testosterone and fsh whether they directly have any impact on this uh, a dna fragmentation sir you know, like... the main idea is to increase the intratesticular testosterone for that oral um, hormones uh, usually we give whenever that libido is reduced and things like that but we don't give oral testosterone or intramuscular testosterone but the, we often see the general practitioners giving intramuscular testosterone depo injections once in a month or once in two weeks and that causes azoospermia actually and uh, because of the negative feedback azoospermia occurs and once you stop the injection a rebound phenomena occurs and spermatogenesis that is what the theory is but practically we don't find it in day to day practice so the best way of increasing the intratestricular testosterone is to give hcg injection low doses 2000 units or you can give um, recombinant hcg 250 microgram so these are the ways of increasing the intratestricular testosterone you can't give oral testosterone and try to improve it it is not going to act and uh, you find the results are much much better with intra with hcg usually we give 2000 twice weekly or uh, if you go for hypo hypo you can give 250 weekly once that's a recombinant hcg and you kind you can you are able to increase the um, what you call the intra testosterone level i think roughly 250 microgram of uh, what you call the recombinant will be equal to around uh, 5000 uh, units of hcg uh, instead of giving 5000 weekly you can split it up once in 3 days and give 2000 units uh, twice weekly and once you measure the testosterone level and see that the testosterone level has increased and later on after 6 to weeks or 8 weeks you can add fsh also and you are able to uh, improve the subtle cell function and uh, the sperm production also starts improving yes sir and sir one more thing is like uh, whether these microorganisms like uh, e coli or any other uh, bacteria have any impact on this uh, dna fragmentation sir that uh, dna yeah. fragmentation especially leukocytospermia as i told if it is more than 1 million okay uh, you have to um, give them a long term antibiotics especially the prostatic infection the seminal vesicle vesiculitis uh, you find whenever you do a sperm analysis and you have more than 1 million sperms 1 million leukocytosperm leukocytospermia you may have to treat these infections for a prolonged period of time of 4 to 6 weeks usually the quinoline groups the the what do you call the norfloxacin or the ciprofloxacin groups are uh, the group of drugs which are given for 4 to 6 weeks i still remember a patient who had lots of pus cells in spite of giving antibiotics for 3 weeks 4 weeks and finally uh, this patient uh, tested positive for tuberculosis and tuberculosis also should be kept in mind especially tuberculosis the epidermis for which uh, anti tuberculosis therapy had to be given to this patient and he responded it much better and uh, you know, and we found that the leukocytospermia disappeared and the sperm count started improving after 6 to 8 months okay sir and there is a question from the dr mohan shenai like clenifelter syndrome success rate with sperm retrieval techniques could you provide insight on predictive values sir what is it clinical no sir uh, clenifelter syndrome Kleinfelter, Kleinfelter. Ah, yeah, Kleinfelter syndrome. Ah, uh, Kleinfelter syndrome. Ah, uh, sperm retrieval. Ah, uh, they have uh, retrieved the sperms in forty-two percentage of the patients with Kleinfelter syndrome. 
So Klein Kleinfelter syndrome also, when you do the sperm retrieval, almost 40 to 42 percentage of the cases they could retrieve the sperms. So a lot of reports have come where pregnancy has been reported after they have given the what you call the hormonal therapy and they retrieved sperms after eight weeks of uh, HCG and FSH therapy and the sperm retrieval rate is around 42 percentage. Uh, yes, sir. And another question from Dr. Priya Radhakrishnan. Recombinant HCG 250 microgram and uh, 2000 IU HCG are equivalent or not, sir? They're not equivalent. As I told you, uh, whenever we give recombinant um, uh, HCG 250 microgram, uh, we usually give uh, 5,000 to 10,000 units of uh, HCG, urinary HCG. Uh, so, 2000, 250 should be equivalent to 5,000 international units. And uh, they're not, so in, if you give um, recombinant, it is 250 microgram weekly. Or uh, if you give urinary preparation, we give small doses, 2000 twice weekly is quite sufficient enough. And uh, you find that the um, results are almost same in this two group of patients. Yes, the next question is from Bimal John. And uh, when biopsy shows early maturation arrest, will micro test help? Um, as um, um, Bimal is a good friend of mine, also, uh, shows a micro, but maturation arrest is a very difficult proponent whether you get a primary arrest is the primary spermatocyte or a secondary spermatocyte level. Uh, we usually give um, uh, the same therapy which we give for uh, hypo hypo patients, a uh, course of HCG for uh, six to eight weeks, following that FSH for uh, three to six months. But when compared to hypo hypo, we find that uh, in maturation arrest, the results are not as good as hypo hypo. It should be less than 10, it is around 10 to 15 percentage, whereas in hypo hypo patients, more than 25 or 30 percentage do respond. So, but you can't use these sperms for previously people used to get uh, pregnancies, report pregnancies with spermatids, but because of the uh, genomic disorders, imprinting disorders being associated, uh, it has not been recommended to go for the uh, what you call immature sperm cells are being you not to use it for the ICSI procedures. So you can give the, the what you call the gonadotrophins, HCG, recombinant uh, weekly for uh, six to eight weeks, followed by recombinant FSH also twice weekly and see the response and monitor them by testosterone and estradiol level and see the ratio. Look at the FSH LH also and see whether the ratios are coming back to normal. And roughly less than 30 percentage, you may get some sort of a positive response on sperm retrieval. Yes, and the last question is from Dr. Devika Rani. Is there a condition called subclinical varicocele seen only in uh, ultrasound scan, I think? You yeah, don't... subclinical, uh, uh, because clinically you have to diagnose varicocele. Subclinical varicocele, there is a condition where in ultrasound, there is a sonologist tells you that there is a grade one varicocele. But normally a palpable varicocele or a grade two varicocele where the motility or the count is affected. So not only the motility and count, nowadays you have to look for the sperm DNA fragmentation. When the DNA fragmentation is less than 30, that is an indication for doing for varicocelectomy. So subclinical varicocele, we don't go for surgery. Grade two also, we don't go. Only palpable varicocele, when the patient is symptomatic or when the motility or count is affected, now we have added Whenever the sperm DNA fragmentation also is more than 30, we may think about going for surgery. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I could not find any other questions in the chat box, sir. So okay. if you allow us, then we can end the webinar for the day today, sir. Yeah. Yeah, sir. So thank you very much for your presence and spending your valuable time, sir. Okay. On behalf of SHIELD, I would like to thank all the delegates for their patient listening and active participation in the webinar, sir. So, like thank you thank, and all, sir. Yeah, I'd like to thank Shield for giving me this opportunity for a topic uh, of my interest. And uh, I have taken most of these from the literature, especially from uh, Sandro Estevez group. 
and try to share how to go ahead in a case of asuspermia, how to go with the sperm retrieval techniques, and what is the most recent way of going ahead. Thank you very much, and I hope that it, will be, it was useful. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Are you? 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 Are you?